This is Ms. Norton from D.C. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm glad that my Republican friends have called this hearing uh, to discuss money and resources uh, in the judicial system. But as usual, they come down on the side of corporations and billionaires, not people. Uh, my question is for Professor Clark. What my uh, colleagues seem to take issue with is access to the courts that is sometimes made possible by third-party litigation funding. Republicans have a problem with ordinary Americans being able to afford lawsuits after they are injured or their loved ones killed by major corporations. Uh, Professor uh, Stinnett said it best, <laughs> and I'm quoting, litigation funding will reduce systemic inequalities in our legal system by altering the bargaining position of individual class and sovereign plaintiffs and corporate defendants, end quote. Third party litigation funding levels the playing field. Uh, it's as simple as that. It gives plaintiffs, in other words, the people who have been harmed, the opportunity to have their case heard and obtain justice. Fundamentally, a lack of money should not prevent any individual American from seeking justice when they have been harmed. Likewise, on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, money should not be uh, the determining factor in, re in receiving the attention of and fairness from the Supreme Court. The notion that you need to be wealthy in order to assess justice is completely at odds with the idea that justice is blind, which is central to the American legal system. Sadly, the reality is that some of the wealthiest people in our country have apparently brought an audience with some of our Supreme Court justices. Justice Thomas, Justices Thomas and Alito have accepted extravagant gifts and have benefited from favors and donations worth millions of dollars. They have attended lavish vacations, flown on private jets, and received expensive gifts from billionaires, all while failing to discuss any of it to the American people. This is, an, in part, is enabled uh, by the Supreme Court refusal to abide by a binding code of ethics. Professor Clark, how does the lack of judicial, of a judicial code of ethics invite money and influence into the Supreme Court? Thank you, Member Norton. As you indicated and as I testified, the Supreme Court um, is not bound by the same code of conduct that applies to other federal judges. And the lack of accountability mechanisms uh, for you know, violating or effective accountability mechanisms for, say, uh, violating uh, recusal rules or uh, disclosure obligations, I believe has invited, has made almost inevitable the kind of activities that we have seen in recent news reports. And that's why, I, as I testified, I think it's important to focus not just on the individual justices and what they have done wrong, but the need for an institutional response. Because frankly, the problem is larger than just one or two justices. It's the lack of uh, effective ethics standards and enforcement mechanisms for the court. The, the, re the revelations that members of the highest court in the land may be compromised by immense wealth is fundamentally at odds with the principle that justice is blind. Without any immediate course uh, correction by the U.S. Supreme Court, including by abiding by a binding code of ethics, the impartiality and neutrality of our justice system is at risk. Money should not be a barrier to assessing the judicial system and wealth should not be what buys you an audience with the judges sitting on the nation's highest court. I yield back. 